During the war in Ukraine, thousands of children have been abducted by Russia and shipped to re-education camps. Every day they're required to sing the Russian national anthem, wear Russian military gear, and many could ultimately be forced to fight in the war against their home country. We're still hoping to bring them back home. They're still our children. In a new Frontline documentary, The Children of Ukraine, investigators talk to some of those children and document the search for others still missing. The film's director and producer, Paul Kenyon, joins me now to discuss. Paul, thank you so much for being here. Hi, it's good to see you. So as many as 19,000 Ukrainian children are currently being held in Russian territory. Can you speak to us about how they got there? How do these children get taken by Russian authorities? Yeah, I mean, it's quite interesting. So what happens is that as the Russian line advances through the east of Ukraine at the beginning of the war in 2022, um, as they sweep in, if you think about it, there are children who are there who are in orphanages, in schools. Um, and as the Russian line goes through, you know, in the morning, they're part of Ukraine. In the afternoon, they're swept through by Russian troops and they're suddenly part of a different country. So what happens is that the Russians then take them out of these schools and orphanages, push them back into Russia proper, put them into other orphanages and schools and camps. And uh, a lot of these children um, then end up in a situation where, as we discover in our film, they're being indoctrinated. They're being given propaganda, forced to wear Russian uniforms uh, and forced to sing the, the, the Russian anthem. And so what's actually happening here, if you think about it, is it's just as the line progresses, the Russian line, it's very, very difficult for the children to flee or for the parents to take them. So it's at that critical moment that the Russians are able to take advantage of the situation. And in some of these cases, though, parents actually sent their kids to camp. They thought they were sending their kids just for a couple of weeks to go to some camp, which I got to say, in, in, in some ways, it, it, it feels here like crazy to, to send your, your children, you know, into Russian held territory. Is that more culturally normal there than it than it feels here? Yeah, I mean, what you're talking about specifically there is it's the area of Kherson, which is in southern Ukraine, very close to Crimea. And what actually happened is, if you think about it, once the Russians have taken that area, um, the, some of the, the, the new Russian teachers would say, look, the children need respite here from the bombing, from the, the Ukrainian and the Russian fighting and from the shelling. So what we're going to do is we're going to take them to a camp. Are you OK with that? We think it's a good thing. And the parents would say... Well, yeah, if they just get a two-week break. The children then disappear off to camps in Crimea. And what happens in the meantime is the Ukrainians then retake that territory. So if you think about it, once the Ukrainians have retaken the territory, the children are off in, in, a, in, a, in a camp somewhere still behind so the, the children and the parents become separated. So even though it sounds bizarre that the parents have said, yes, they can go off to this camp, at the time, the parents were thinking, respite from war, not a bad thing. We're not going to be separated. We can go and get them back as soon as we like. But that never happened. So some of these children are then, they're, they're, you're suddenly separated by the line, by the front line. And, you know, the Russians would say, what we're actually doing at that point is we're saving the children from a very dangerous situation. We're taking them behind uh, Russian lines and back into, into Russia proper. And if the, if the parents ever want them back, then you come and collect them. Feel free. They're there for you. But of course, that's not really how it is. That's quite a cynical approach from the Russians, because what can you really do as a young mother looking to go and get your child back on the other side of the lines? You can't cross the line. It's too dangerous. So some of them have gone all the way through Belarus, all the way west, and then back into Russia, spending, what, two and a half, three thousand mile journeys sometimes to get back to try and then reclaim their children. And it's a dangerous thing to go and do. Of course. Tell us more about these camps, where these kids are being kept and what the conditions are like and, and what they're being made to do. So traditionally, there have been quite a lot of summer camps in Crimea. And traditionally, it was a place where children would go, like summer camps in the US. Uh, they would go there and they would um, become at one with nature. They would go swimming. They would enjoy the forests. Uh, they would, as you see here, play basketball. And, they, they, you know, they were away from their parents. So it's character development. Um, but what happened after 2022 and the beginning of the war is that um, these camps transformed into something Thing rather different, which was that these young uh, Ukrainian children ended up going there and ended up finding themselves 
been sent to something more akin to a military training camp. So as you can see, they're ending up being dressed in military costumes, uh, singing uh, Russian songs, and uh, and being the whole thing has got a military flavour about it, and they can't get back to their parents. It's not like they can phone their parents in the evening and say, listen, everything's OK, I'm happy, you know, we'll get back together one day. They can't phone their parents, and they're being fed a propaganda of the enemy state. So if you think about it, if you're one of the parents, the point is that your children are being re-educated in the, in the language and the culture of the enemy, the people who are fighting you, and sometimes these little kids, their fathers are part of the Ukrainian army. So you're being educated against your upbringing, against your father, against your parents, against your neighbour. And, and you know, this is something that um, Putin and his children's commissioner already have an indictment from the International Criminal Court over, which is um, the, 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 the movement, the, the kidnapping, if you like. The official language, I can tell you, it is the, um, when they take these children, um, it is, the official language is, the, uh, the criminal responsibility for the unlawful deportation and transfer of children from occupied areas of Ukraine to Russia. So what's actually happening there is they're taking the children uh, from occupied areas into Russia proper. So, you know, there's the, the, the international criminal courts are already looking to prosecute uh, uh, President Putin and his children's commissioner. Realistically, the possibility of that ever happening is pretty remote because Putin isn't going to go to a country where he's likely to be arrested. But, you know, this is... This is, um, it's, it's not just serious, it's incredibly deep and it's widespread. It's not 5, 10, 15, 20 children, it's 19,000 children that have gone missing uh, from Ukraine in the last two years and cannot be found. And your documentary follows some of the investigators that are collecting evidence to support that charge in the International Criminal Court. But as you said, it, it seems unlikely that really any accountability, uh, certainly criminal charges against Putin and other senior officials, could lead to anything. No, it's highly unlikely. He would have to be in a country where they, prepare, where they were prepared to go and arrest him, and that isn't something that's going to happen anytime soon. And it's interesting, you know, in our film, you see Putin on a stage in Moscow, surrounded by celebrating crowds, a little bit like it was a huge football stadium in the US, and um, Putin comes on stage and everybody's applauding him. And the purpose of this particular piece of huge propaganda jamboree, if you like, is that Putin is there with lots of small children. And the extraordinary thing is that these are Ukrainian children. They're not Russian children. And they come on stage and the organisers say, um, don't you want to turn to all the soldiers, the Russian soldiers who've saved you, who've saved you from Ukraine? And the children say, thank you so much for saving us from the Ukrainians. Now, they're, they're kids. They're six, seven, eight years old. They've no idea who they were being saved, for. They, they're saved from. They've been told to say this. And when you watch something like that, you think, my goodness, this is something that Putin is using in itself as a piece of propaganda. He's saying to his Russian audience, we have saved these children from the awful Ukrainians and from what was going to happen to them. And now we're all here to celebrate that we're making them into proper Russians. And that's something that, so it's not something that Putin is denying. He's just saying there's a different reason that they're doing it. Yeah, that scene with the children hugging the, the soldiers at that rally is, is absolutely striking. It's just shocking. One of the kids that you interviewed uh, for this documentary is named Vlad, and he uh, resisted this indoctrination and, and, in fact, took down a, uh, a Russian flag and, and hung his uh, underwear uh, in, in place, um, but was disciplined for that. He was put in solitary confinement, and, uh, and he was threatened by a soldier. Here's, here's a little what he had to say. Могут тебя убить в любой день, приехать, забрать. Самое страшное, наверное, это умереть там. It's incredible. Are, they, are these camps or are they prisons or are they some combination? This was a, a camp um, which had originally been a holiday camp and became a children's camp for Ukrainians, almost exclusively for Ukrainians, and where they were taught military ways. So a lot of these children, you can see he's sort of 16, 17 years old, um, what happens is they get transferred to military training camps and then they're taught to become part of the Russian army. 
And obviously the situation there is that who are they being taught to fight? The Russian army is only fighting one large war at the moment, and that's against Ukraine. So these children are being pushed into military training camps and then being expected to fight against, you know, in, in an extreme case, their own neighbours, their own fathers, their own families. That's how extraordinary it is. You described that scene, of course, uh, at that rally. I, the big question is, is really why is Russia actually doing this? Here's what somebody from the International Partnership for Human Rights had to say about that. The main purpose is to erase our national identity by this ideological, political, cultural, and sometimes even military re-education. Um, Russians try to uh, like discourage us, uh, and uh, obviously they want us to lose our identity and obey to their narratives. Is that a fair summary of what's going on here? And, and could this be an effective military uh, tool for Russia? Yeah, I, I think that is a, a fair summary that she gave there. And what she's actually describing is something the International Criminal Court uh, would say was a, a form of genocide. So it's with intent to destroy, in whole or in part, a nation or ethnic group. So what that particular um, NGO that we were working with, what they would say is they're giving uh, evidence to the ICC, which they think is proof of genocide by Putin and his uh, children's commissioner. What historical precedents are there for this kind of mass abduction of children? Is this something we've seen in wars before? No, um, it's, it's, it is particularly rare. And it's interesting because what it actually means is, you know, we all think of... Uh, we see shelling, we see destroyed buildings, we think that that is the way the wars are conducted. And there are, in fact, many other levels which are more insidious uh, and more, more troublesome in some ways. And this is, they would say, the Ukrainians would say, about extinguishing young people's idea of their own national identity. So it's deep-rooted, it's very difficult to fight against. Um, have we seen it before? I was talking to one of your colleagues the other day in North Dakota who was saying... We have seen it before. There's a precedent here, which is the native Indians and the way that they were treated by the colonial forces when they came and that native Indian children were taken away from their families without their permission. They were taken to institutions where they were brainwashed, if you like, into the new ways of the colonials. So, you know, there's something there almost on your own doorstep. Yeah, that's an interesting, a very interesting point. Um, your documentary follows a group of women who worked with an organization called Save Ukraine to try to get their children back, including uh, an older woman, a grandmother named Olha. Can you tell us a little bit about her story and about this effort to retrieve these children? Yeah, there's, um, Safe Ukraine is an extraordinary NGO, and what they're trying to do is locate, first of all, uh, missing Ukrainian children, and then they're trying to facilitate their return to Ukraine. Incredibly difficult to do. And they're a very dedicated group, and we spent some time with them. Uh, they sent off a, uh, a group of mums and grandmothers to, who knew where their children were, and were going to try and relocate, and they were going to try and locate them. And... Um, this particular grandmother, um, called Ola, very brave, and uh, had decided she would go all the way to one of these Crimean camps and pick up her two granddaughters who were missing. And uh, she set off with a group of others. They were interrogated in Moscow by um, a group of, um, uh, of, of, of secret police, and they, um, which she found, by all accounts, extraordinarily traumatic. Uh, and they continued their journey, and... Um, a couple of days later, while still on the road and only a few miles from collecting her granddaughters, uh, this, this grandmother, Ola, collapsed uh, and couldn't be resuscitated. She had a heart attack on the pavement there. And her family have said, you know, that re the reason that happened was she was so stressed by being interrogated by the Russian security officials um, that she never recovered and that's why she died. So um, it's a a really, really terrible story. There's one little sort of, um, there's, there's, a, there's a bright moment in that towards the end, which is that the, the granddaughter does manage to get home eventually. She is saved. You have to see 
the film to see that moment. But it's an extraordinary moment. I mean, when she is reunited uh, with what remains of her family, even when I watch it now, it still brings a tear to my eye. Because this is a young woman, I think she's 14 or 15 at the time. She's been held in a Crimean camp by the Russians for seven months. And when she finally gets back, the doors of the minibus open and she jumps out. She sees members of her family there and you just see the pure joy in her face. It's an extraordinary moment. Another of the kids that you spoke with, uh, his name's uh, Serhi, and you actually spoke with his father. Here's what he had to say. Serhi's father says that the soldiers learned that he had been adopted and said this was not recognized under Russian law. To them, Serhi was an orphan. We understand that under Russian law, we are this idea that Russia doesn't recognize adoptions was just shocking to me. Um, and I'm wondering if there are there other examples that we found, other evidence that uh, other adoptive children uh, have been taken by Russia for this reason. It's, it's a really grey area and absolutely fascinating. And so that particular gentleman, he had quite a lot of adopted children. Uh, and he said when the Russians took over his town, they came in with guns and said, hey, we don't accept Ukrainian adoption. To us, there's no such thing. These children are orphans. So we're going to take this one who's 16. We're going to take him away because he wants to be part of the Russian army. And uh, it was really interesting how they behaved to that child. They'd, um, they'd offered him, he's a 16-year-old, they offered him his own car, his own house, lots of alcohol, lots of girls, and he eventually said, yeah, why not? I mean, I'm in a war zone here and you're offering me this extraordinary life. So he went away. But he was 16 years old and he realised when he'd been away for a few months they were going to put him into the uh, the Russian army. And at that point he decided he needed to escape. Um, and he did. He managed to get back to Ukraine and we do interview him in the programme. But yeah, the idea that the Russians don't accept that particular form, that, a, a, any form of adoption, we can't confirm whether or not that is the case, but we do know that it's not the only one where a Ukrainian child has been taken away because they don't recognize Ukrainian adoption. Paul, I just wanted to ask you a little bit about reporting this. I mean, this required you to go into a, a war zone. What was that experience like for you and how did you report this? Yeah, so I've, I've worked for the BBC in the UK for a long period of time, and I've done quite a lot of um, war zone reporting for them. So, And I've spent a lot of time in Ukraine since 2014. But this was a particularly difficult one because all the stories are, on, are in freshly liberated uh, Ukrainian territory. So they're right up against the front line, and you have to go there in order to see what's happening. Um, so what that means is that... Um, you have to be phenomenally well organized because there's a curfew all down that side of the country. So, for instance, if you're in Kharkiv, which in itself is quite close to the front, and you need to travel eastwards right to the very, maybe two or three kilometers from the front, you know, there's, there's a curfew. You can't set off when it's dark. You may drive for four hours. I get a through, we drove through fields with a, quite a big crew. So we had uh, safety advisors, we had me, a cameraman, uh, we had translators with us, and you set up across the fields and you get very close to the front line. And what always amazes me about these situations is, you know, it's quite a frightening process. We're all there, your heart goes up a few beats and you think anything can happen. There are Russian drones everywhere around here. Yeah. You'd be very unlucky if you were hit, but it could, it's a possibility. And what strikes me every time is you, you get to these places where you think, there's going to be nobody there. It's going to be deserted. We, we arrived at a small village and there are people there and they're trying to live a normal life. And they're so used to incoming shelling that it, they ba barely hear it. One of them, the, the mother and father of one of the children, um, cooked us a big barbecue outside. In the background, you could hear incoming shelling. You could hear sirens going off. And we're sitting there saying, Is it, are we all OK with this? And they say... Okay with what? Yeah, I mean, everything's fine. It's a daily occurrence for them. It's they thought nothing of it, so it's extraordinary. Live with, yeah. It's absolutely, the result is an incredible uh, and, and poignant and powerful documentary. Uh, Paul Kenyon, thank you so much for coming on Greater Boston to talk with us about it. Thank you. You can watch Children of Ukraine tonight at 10, right here on Channel 2, on the PBS app, or online at pbs.org slash frontline.